I'm Mark Branley, and I get to talk about um, one of my favorite topics, the oil industry. Um, I'm uh, biased towards this industry. I've worked in this, the oil industry for many years. Uh, my, my dad was an oil man, and other family members were oil men. And um, uh, I just thought it was important to reveal my biases here before we start. Um, I think while this is not a specifically Austrian topic, I think there are lessons to be learned here. So when I, when I uh, read, say, Rothbard's Power and Market, and he explains how interventions will have certain effects, you can clearly see some of these effects in this industry. So, so this industry sort of illustrates some of the things um, Mises and Rothbard have said here. Um, let me sh just uh, introduce you to a couple of uh, um, uh, pictures here regarding the oil industry. Here we have, uh, this is just an onshore drilling rig drilling into the ground. And then of course there's also offshore drilling rigs where we're able to recover oil from underneath the oceans. And here's, the, here's an infinite, infamous uh, frack job in Texas pumping, I don't know, millions of gallons of water into the ground to fracture the zone to uh, recover oil and gas. And if you're in oil country, you probably see these pumping units pumping oil out of the ground uh, continually. And I've been around these rigs and pumping units and frack jobs uh, quite a bit. Um, the oil industry for decades is sort, and the other fossil fuel industries have sort of been under attack. Uh, I can remember in the 1970s when Paul Ehrlich and others uh, were winning awards by uh, telling us that uh, if we didn't decrease our use of fossil fuels, we were all going to die soon. And uh, fortunately, uh, their dire predictions never came to pass. And and instead of decreasing our uh, use of fossil fuels. Fortunately, we've uh, ignored those warnings and we've increased our burning of fossil fuels. Uh, from 1980 to 2012, the world increased its usage of oil 39% and its usage of natural gas 131%. But despite those advances, uh, still today about 1.3 billion people in the world have no electricity and 3 billion people do not have adequate electricity, so they have intermittent electricity. And uh, somewhere, depending on what statistics you look at, somewhere between 10 and 50 percent of the world's population are underfed and do not have enough food to lead a healthy life. So I think we need to burn more fossil fuels to produce <laughs> the food and the electricity so these people will, st will uh, stay alive. We need to ignore these warnings that have uh, uh, proved to be uh, false in the past. And we should um, appreciate the oil entrepreneurs who have brought us these, uh, the oil and gas. The, the story of oil, at least the drilling of oil in the US, uh, goes back to 1859. Um, what was happening was uh, we were uh, killing lots of whales for whale oil to put in our lamps to illuminate things. And whale oil was getting expensive. And a Canadian chemist named Abraham Gessner invented, uh, realized we could take crude oil and convert it to kerosene, and if we had enough crude oil, we could stop killing the whales. And this led to the, uh, uh, an incentive to drill for oil, and this is the first oil well in the U.S. Uh, near Titusville, Pennsylvania. Um, and, um, and because of the, the resulting oil boom, we were able to uh, stop the slaughter, or at least reduce the slaughter of whales and I don't have any uh, data to back this up, but I suspect uh, uh, the oil industry has saved more whales than Greenpeace. That's a, I suspect. I don't have any. <laughs> Being a good Austrian, I have no data here to back this up. <laughs> um, and then um, the, uh, the plaque here, uh, the plaque, this is now a tourist site. Uh, Edwin Drake was the entrepreneur that Drilled the well. He was. He didn't finance the well, but he's the. He was. Uh, uh, he engineered the well. He's the. He, I don't know if you can see it. He's the gentleman on the right there, and this is now a tourist attraction. And the, and the plaque there says, among other things, that few events in history have so transformed 
the face of civilization. And I think that's probably correct. So uh, the, this, uh, the, the, the discovery that we could uh, uh, recover all of this oil from the ground led to uh, not only expansion of the production of kerosene, uh, replacing whale oil, but uh, a few years later we realized we could, at the time we were just uh, basically throwing the gasoline away through the refinery process. And we realized, people realized, well, uh, with the invention of the internal combustion engine and other machinery, we realized we could start using this gasoline. And uh, so in addition to powering, to a degree, the industry of the Industrial Revolution, the uh, oil industry really gave us the fuel we need to transport goods around the globe. And this has led to a, a tremendous increase in the extent of the market and the division of labor and the resulting uh, prosperity of this that uh, uh, Dr. Rittenauer talked about earlier in the week. So I think we should applaud these oil entrepreneurs. Uh, there's a lot of them, but I'm, I won't uh, spend too much time on that. I would like to talk about uh, one oil entrepreneur that's uh, one of the entrepreneurs uh, responsible for the uh, current uh, revolution in oil production from these tight oil sands. He's not the only one responsible for this, but uh, George Mitchell was the owner. He's, he was the owner of Mitchell Energy in Texas. Uh, he did a lot of um, uh, work in the in the Barnett Shale near Dallas, and um, he um, he put a lot of money into environmental issues. And he wanted to uh, replace this, uh, the burning of coal for electricity with natural gas. And there was these, for, for a long time, we've known there were these tight oil shales that were just full of oil and natural gas, mainly natural gas. But we didn't know how to get it out of the ground. If you wait long enough, the oil from those source rocks will uh, uh, work its way up to another formation in 20 million years, and then we can get it out of the ground. But George Mitchell said, we want to get it out of the ground now. So he poured uh, lots of money, millions of dollars, into developing uh, drilling techniques where we could drill horizontally through the zones and uh, more effective fracturing techniques. And um, uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, uh, I think this is a good example of the Misesian capitalist entrepreneurs, the driving force in an industry. And it turned out he eventually was successful in developing these technologies and uh, there are articles where his employees were saying they thought he was wasting his money and they thought he was crazy for, for doing all of this. And, but he was able to sell Mitchell Energy for uh, $3.1 billion. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the government has spent... Um, 160 years interfering with this entrepreneurial role in the oil and gas industry, not surprisingly. And I, I have time to tell you a, a few examples here. I'll skip the first 110 years of uh, government intervention, and I'll uh, jump to the famous uh, price controls of the 1970s here. So uh, there's a, an organization you're probably aware of, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It was formed in 1959. It didn't have a, really any market power for the first 15 years or so. Um, even in 1971, there was really, um, OPEC had no market power. The price of oil was hovering around only $2 a barrel, but the federal government instituted some price ceilings here in this market the price ceilings really had almost no effect about on what was going on. And then um, late in 1973, these um, Arab countries, these Arab governments uh, were angry at our government for geopolitical reasons, and they wanted to punish us, so they started refusing to sell us oil, this famous oil embargo. So the price of oil started trending up, and then the federal government stepped in with a series of price ceilings. And then throughout the, throughout the 1970s, the, the price ceilings kept changing as, as conditions changed. Um, so I, I won't go through the whole history here. But it, in 1979, we ended up with three different prices for oil. So um, uh, uh, early in 1979, the price was only about $20 a barrel for oil, hovering around that. 
And then in 1979, the uh, Iranians overthrew the Shah that was supported by the U.S. federal government. And this completely disrupted oil supplies out of the Mideast. And over the course of the year, the price went up to close to $40 a barrel. But during this, at this time, there were three prices for oil. So um, they called it old oil. So any oil wells drilled before the embargo had this old oil price of $5.75 a barrel. So the reasoning was, since you drilled the well when the price of oil was $2 a barrel, you shouldn't be allowed to have these tremendous profits from, <laughs> from, just, uh, from the fact that Arab countries are mad at us, right? So, but then if you capped all oil at $5.75 a barrel, then there wouldn't be much new drilling because it just wouldn't be profitable. So any wells drilled after the oil embargo, that was called new oil, they had a price ceiling of $12.66 a barrel. Most of the time, they were trying to keep the new oil at about two-thirds of the uh, OPEC price. But suddenly, there's this jump in uh, 19, uh, around 1979 to 80, up to $40 a barrel. Now, to prevent uh, wells from just being plugged and abandoned when they, when they didn't have much production, they also have stripper wells, which are wells that make 10 barrels of oil a day or less. And those had no price ceiling. So you, you could sell that oil for the same price as imported oil. All right, so uh, what happened here was, um, you know, we know that price ceilings tend to cause shortages, but in a sense, there were no shortages because you could buy all the oil you wanted to as long as you were willing to pay for imported oil. It was a very odd uh, um, uh, situation. And the problem was the government was trying to to um, accomplish two things at once. One thing they were trying to do, they kept saying they were trying to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, but at the other time they were saying, well, we need low energy prices and we need to prevent companies from having these, reaping these windfall profits simply by selling oil. So, um, um, so if, if some of the oil costs $12 a barrel, they were thinking, well, gasoline will be a little cheaper, and other energy costs will be a little cheaper. So this will save the American consumer money. However, the, 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 two, the two goals are in conflict with one another. If we're, if we're going to produce less oil, if we're going to keep the price down, we're going to produce less oil, so we're going to import more oil. If you follow this history, it appears that since the oil embargo, the U.S. government has spent most of its time regarding oil policies supporting OPEC, doing things to drive up the price of oil, and uh, giving OPEC more market power. And this is one example of that. All right, you could probably see where we're headed here. These controls, of course, negatively impacted oil production and increased oil imports, uh, an obvious uh, uh, conclusion. But it also led to this misallocation of resources. So, so. Um, if you had oil wells, you could sell some oil for $5.75 a barrel, and some for $12.66 a barrel, and some $40 a barrel. So of course, you spent your time trying to produce the expensive oil. So if it cost you $20 a barrel to get oil out of the ground out of a stripper well, that was profitable, very profitable. However, if it cost you a $6 a barrel to get a barrel of oil out of the ground from an old oil well, that was not profitable. So you end up spending your time, wasting your resources, getting the uneconomical oil out of the ground. I was aware of one situation where a company drilled a well that they knew would not produce any oil. They drilled it, they produced it, it would make about three barrels a month or something. But it gave the other wells, three other wells in the field, a higher oil price. <laughs> it moved it into a different category of oil. So, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you, you just uh, your your whole uh, decision making process is not about getting oil out of the ground efficiently. It's about trying to figure out the system and try to trying to sort of game the system to maximize your profits. But the the problems were so obvious that eventually uh, they scrapped the system, and they said let's just replace it with a windfall profits tax. Um, uh, in the proposal for the tax. Uh, Jimmy Carter said, uh, this, would, this tax will collect as much revenue as any tax in history, something like that. And he was saying this approvingly. This was, in, this was his statement in favor of the tax. Right? So, um, 
but the, uh, uh, the tax ended up not collecting much revenue because oil prices fell during out the 1980s and, and, uh, and uh, for years companies would fill out the windfall profits tax form and put zeros on them every month and send them in and say, we don't owe, we don't owe you any money. Um, Murray Rothbard said, he's not talking about this specific tax, but he's saying windfall profits tax, uh, he, said, he says, uh, it's difficult to find a tax more indefensible from more points of view than this one. Because it, the, the profits tax, one more profits tax, completely reduces the entrepreneur's incentive to make uh, decisions here. All right, that allows me to segue to another tax, which technically is not a profits tax, it's a revenue tax. Uh, there are taxes on oil and gas called severance taxes. Uh, the, the, these are, uh, at, the, at least in the United States, they're, they're state level taxes for the most part. And uh, they, a lot of states put taxes on various non-renewable resources. The argument is that uh, the resources under the ground in Alabama are sort of owned. Doesn't the whole population of Alabama sort of have a claim on these? Well, that's the argument. <laughs> and so if you're going to sever the resources, you should have to pay a tax. Right? If you're going to sever the resources from the ground. So you get taxed even if you don't sell the oil. If you, if you sever the oil from the ground, <laughs> there's a tax. Right? Um, there's $8 billion of tax revenue from the various severance taxes in uh, two years ago. Here are some of the tax rates. Alabama has a basic tax rate of 8%. Uh, and you can see... Uh, Alaska's tax is actually a profits tax. Uh, Florida, Louisiana is a big oil state. Uh, their, their tax is 12.5%. These are the basic tax rates. Some, some states, a lot of states have uh, lower tax rates for stripper wells that produce less than 10 barrels of oil a day or less. But this is the, the basic tax rate. All right, these might not look like very high taxes. What's 8%? But it's not 8% of profits, it's 8% of revenues. So if you, um, if you invest uh, $4 million drilling oil wells in Alabama and you make revenues of $5 million, this huge 25% return on your investment, you have to pay 8% of $5 million. So you have to pay $400,000 of taxes. So you have to pay 40% of your profits for this hugely profitable investment would go to the state. And if you only make 8% profit, which is a fair profit, I mean, not by fair, I don't mean ethically fair. I mean, you can make money at 8% profit. The state takes all of your profit. They take 8% of your revenue. So these, these taxes really distort the, the, all companies consider these taxes when they're making their drilling and production decisions. Because it's, even though they're, they look like relatively low rates, these are, high percentage of your profits. All right, again, uh, the various states are helping out OPEC by imposing these taxes and decreasing production. Uh, but there are, other, uh, uh, there are other things going on here. Um, in the oil field, the, the, the costs of capital and services and wages tend to fluctuate rather quickly. So, so they're not locked in. Like when, when oil prices fell in the 1980s, workers were just taking uh, pay cuts overnight. They were just, you want the job, you're getting paid less today than you were getting paid yesterday, right? All right, this is, and this fits uh, the analysis we see uh, by Murray Rothbard uh, regarding uh, tax shifting onto the factors of production. Rothbard says, uh, if you tax, uh, if you tax, uh, a product that you lower the demand for the workers and you lower the demand for the capital. So of course your your uh, capital prices and the price of services and labor all fall. And so you're shifting the tax onto these uh, factors of production, just like he ex just like Rothbard explains. And it's just a very obvious uh, result here in the oil industry. Now there's more going on here. I'd like to point out. Um, the uh, the demand for any state's oil is very, very, very elastic. So Alabama's oil production, regardless, whether it increased or decreased 20%, probably does not affect the price of oil. 
or affects it very little. And that's the same for every, basically every state. So if that's true, and that is true, so if that's the case, then if you tax this product, you tend to, to have a, a, a relatively large effect on the number of jobs and the amount of production relative to industries where demand's not elastic like that. So in neoclassical terms, they would say there's a large deadweight loss, and this is an inefficient tax. And we could agree with the uh, inefficiency part, even if we don't accept this deadweight loss idea. So the question on, on the table is, why do states impose these taxes? Why do they impose, do they just hate oil companies? Is this, is, why do they impose these significant taxes on oil and gas production when we know that they have a significant effect on production and jobs? And here's their reasoning. Um, their reasoning is, uh, if you tax... If you taxed another industry at 8% of their revenues in Alabama, they would eventually, in the long run, they would leave the state. You would have no jobs in that industry. Right? If you tax automakers 8% of their revenue, you're going to, they're all going to go to uh, Tennessee or somewhere or overseas. But if you tax Alabama's oil production, they can't move that to Tennessee. Right? It's a trapped industry. You can't produce Alabama's oil uh, wells in Tennessee. So you have this trapped industry. So even though it's a um, even though it's a relatively inefficient relative to other taxes, an inefficient tax, the industry can't do anything about it. They're stuck, right? So, so that's uh, uh, so so state legislators think this is a good target for taxes. And there's another reason uh, Rothbard and others talk about when they when they analyze taxes, they they emphasize the distinction between taxpayers and tax consumers. And this goes, people were saying this before there was an Austrian school. But, um, but this, it's very clear with these oil taxes, there are taxpayers and there are tax consumers. The oil companies are taxpayers and uh, the states uh, collect the taxes and, and uh, spend it on goods and services in their state. And this is why, this is why, uh, um, this, this is why it makes it, an, another good target for st state legislators. So what's happening with oil is the taxes are exported. And when you're exporting taxes, you're taxing people who can't vote for you. Right. So, so you're taxing people, you're collecting them, but they're, they're not going to be mad at you because the, the, they're, 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 they don't live in your state. Right. So the burden of the taxes falls on people outside of your state. So Alaska has very onerous uh, severance taxes. Um, which is why they missed out in the recent uh, uh, oil boom. Their taxes were so high, people did not want to invest there. But the, but the oil companies aren't in Alaska, they're in Texas and elsewhere. So the, the oil companies in Texas are the taxpayers, and then uh, the, the state government of Alaska collects the taxes, the tax revenue, and they end up paying people simply to live in Alaska. There's, there's no state income tax in Alaska. There's a, a, a sort of a, a negative tax for everybody. All right, so these are, these are uh, essentially taxes on profits, and Rothbard, of course, uh, condemns these taxes uh, as uh, interfering with entrepreneurship, as, of course, uh, uh, that makes uh, perfect sense here. All right, there's another industry, or there's another... Um, um, policy that uh, probably is not that big of a deal. It just really irks me. So I want to talk about it. <laughs> it probably, probably doesn't have that big of an effect on things. All right. There's this uh, uh, strategic petroleum reserve. So uh, throughout the course of history, our government at times has stockpiled oil. And this is one example of that. They, they've done it during various wars and stuff. But uh, in response, again, to the uh, situation in the 1970s, uh, the uh, federal government uh, uh, implemented this uh, strategic petroleum reserve. It's very straightforward how this works. Uh, we pump oil out of the ground around the globe, in the U.S. and around the globe. The U.S. government takes taxpayer dollars, buys that oil, ships that oil to Louisiana and Texas, and pumps it back in the ground. 
<laughs> the idea is, if we need it, we'll pump it out of the ground again. This is the strategic petroleum reserve, right? So, <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know where to be begin here. Um, but anyway, um, uh, the program started in 1977, and uh, the first 412,000 barrels was actually purchased from uh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> 412,000 barrels of Saudi Arabian crude. So they pumped it out of the ground in Saudi Arabia, and then we used taxpayer dollars to purchase OPEC oil and, and pump it back in the ground here. Uh, it has a capacity of over 700 million barrels. Um, for some reason, if you check it from year to year, the capacity might change by 10 million barrels. I don't understand what's, what the statistic is, but uh, you would think it's the same capacity. As, they lost, uh, last year was about, uh, I think, 15 million barrels more capacity. So I don't know what's going on here. But it holds a little less than uh, uh, 7 million barrels. Uh, I know, I think the price of oil fell today, but it's roughly $42 billion of oil, which really isn't that much oil. It's a, uh, well, I mean, in the grand scheme of the government's budget, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's nothing really. Uh, uh, they can withdraw it. They, they claim they can withdraw oil at the rate of 4.4 million barrels of oil a day. So the idea is uh, if we needed the oil, this could account for 22, roughly 22% of our oil usage that they could suddenly, uh, the government could suddenly uh, 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 access if they needed to. Um, uh, the alleged purpose here, uh, if you look at some of the uh, comments at the time, I'm not sure that was the purpose, but the alleged purpose was to provide the government with this ability to, um, to uh, influence oil prices. So uh, there are always, uh, uh, oil prices tend to fluctuate quite a bit because the demand and the supply of oil are both inelastic. And so we, in, when, in, you expect them to fluctuate. Right. That's a, an important price signal in oil. We want them to fluctuate so we make good decisions regarding these resources. But uh, uh, the argument we hear from various presidents is that they might need to intervene to stop these uh, fluctuations because the price is volatile. So uh, in, uh, when George W. Bush was president, the price was about $30 a barrel and it started trending downwards. And he said, we can't have that. <laughs> so he said he was stabilizing the price of oil. <laughs> and so he started buying up lots of oil to drive the price back up to $30 a barrel, because for some reason, $30 a barrel was the right price at the time. And uh, can't have inexpensive oil, I suppose. Um, it's kind of a, a, a political payoff to the oil companies. We promise you produce the oil. We promise to buy it from you, but we won't, any, we won't let any consumers have it. And so all industries would appreciate to have, have, you know, the furniture industry would appreciate it. The government would buy up lots of furniture and just store it. <laughs> um, but it does interfere with the, the industry's uh, decisions here. As uh, Dr. Klein, uh, Dr. Klein Wan, I guess, uh, told you that... <laughs> The entrepreneur is making decisions, facing risk and uncertainty, of course, and, uh, and he's basing his decisions on, on his forecast of future events. Somebody has to make these decisions, and the entrepreneur makes them. So what the, what the Strategic Petroleum Reserve does is, um, is now the, 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 it, it takes this uh, forecasting away from the entrepreneur and puts it in the hands of government officials, whoever the administration is. They're deciding what's going to happen, and they're releasing and filling up the, releasing oil from and filling up the strategic petroleum reserve based on their forecasts here. So you might think this is a good thing, but um, this makes it harder for the entrepreneur to make decisions. So if you're drilling oil wells and making these millions of dollars of investments, you're thinking to yourself, what's going to happen in China regarding the demand for oil in the next decade or so? What's going to happen in the U.S. regarding the demand and the supply of oil? What's going to happen in the Mideast regarding the supply of oil? And now you have this additional uh, uncertainty. What's, what is the president going to do when oil prices fluctuate? And so you, you've introduced more uncertainty into their decision making. 
And so this, this uncertainty, this, this complication, uh, it's, it's led uh, private producers to not stockpile oil. So the strate they stockpile about, they have a, in private reserves, we have about a third as much as the st strategic petroleum reserve. Because if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking to yourself, the price of oil is going to go up, I better stockpile some, then you think to yourself, well, if it goes up, the president's going to intervene and drive the price back down. Or he might, you know, I'm, I'm uncertain about this. So you've reduced my incentive to uh, have uh, uh, private stockpiles of oil. So instead of having the private stockpiles of oil, we have uh, the, the, uh, the government holding this oil for us. At the time uh, that they implemented the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, the Louisiana governor was not a, you know, on one hand, he wasn't a big fan of the policy. So he's quoted as saying, uh, if the federal government is going to pour money down a rat hole, I just assume that it was a rat hole in Louisiana. So, <laughs> so he, Louisiana is an oil state, and he thought that this was not the, maybe the best use of federal resources. But if they're going to spend the money, he was glad that the that they were uh, you know building the capital and hiring workers in Louisiana here. All right. Um, so my next uh, 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 topic applies to a lot more than oil, but I just can't uh, resist uh, talking about it. <laughs> and that's the fact that um, the government owns a lot of land. This is probably not a surprise to you. Uh, there's uh, uh, land socialism in a sense. Uh, here's a government map of federal lands. The red is the federal lands. Uh, this does not include the state lands and the local lands, on, the lands owned by state and local governments. This is just the federal lands. So, for instance, there's almost no federal lands in New York, but New York has the highest percentage of um, state-owned lands. So if we included that, there's actually a significant amount of land owned by the government in New York. Uh, at one point, the federal government owned almost all of Alaska, but they've relinquished their ownership and they're down to about 69% of Alaska. But where did the rest of the land go? To the state government, for the most part. So almost all of Alaska is owned by the state. Uh, the feds own almost all of Nevada. And Utah, they own about a third of Colorado, two thirds of Wyoming. Uh, from, the, from the great divide of the Rocky Mountains westward, that's what the federal government owns in various agencies. Uh, the, the largest agencies of, of uh, land ownership, if they were states, would be a, like the Bureau of Land Management would be the fourth largest state. And, and uh, they have 248 million acres. Uh, it's just, there's just massive amounts of, uh, um, of uh, government-owned land here. And these, this, this land is just full of oil and gas and other resources. Um, so uh, if we include the land owned by the state governments and the federal governments, then uh, the governments own 39% of the dry land in the United States. Uh, I'm taking these numbers from congressional reports. Uh, every congressional report that talks about this says we're not sure how much land we own. We're, this is within, say, 10 to 5 to 10 million acres. We're, it's our margin of error. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> and the states don't know how much land they own either. There were, uh, a, a few years ago, there were two governors saying, we're going to find out how much land we own. Wyoming and South Carolina, there were new governors elected. And they said, how much land do you own? Well, we're not sure. <laughs> they made it. Uh, it's a lot. Of, I mean, if you, own, if you own, you know, if there's 900 million acres, it's hard to keep track of this stuff. <laughs> um, uh, there is one caveat here. Um, uh, this includes the Indian lands. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has uh, 55 million acres. And when I do the data, I include that as federal lands, because sometimes Congress includes it, and sometimes they say those are not federal lands. Those are Indian. The Indians own those lands. Mm -hmm. right, so if you're reading the data, 55 million is quite a few acres. <laughs> so, if you're reading the data and you come up with another number, they may be leaving out the Indian lands. Um, 
Uh, doesn't appear to me the Indians think they own the lands, but uh, sometimes the federal government says it's not our lands, it's, uh, that's for the Indians. So there's that caveat here in my numbers. All right, here's the dry lands again owned by the federal government. So you may think that uh, ends the discussion. It does not. <laughs> so, uh, few people know that uh, uh, the federal government has also laid claim to lands offshore under the ocean. So uh, this started uh, in the 1790s when Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State and they proposed that the federal government owns all the offshore lands um, up to three miles offshore. It was called the cannonball rule. They said, since we can fire a cannonball out there, we own it. The government owns it. And then over time, um, uh, particularly in the 20th century, the government claimed more and more land, just sort of informally saying we own it. And, uh, and around mid-century, the last century, they said we own out to the outer continental shelf, but no one really knows where that is. It was a very vague. <laughs> There's no, sometimes it's not clear where the outer, the outer continental shelf is and where it's deeper waters. Um, and then uh, around uh, the 1970s, uh, the, the governments of the world kept claiming more and more land out in the oceans. And then by the 1970s, they realized they were claiming the same lands. Right? So two different governments, because they were starting to overlap. So they started having meetings on this, how should we divide up the oceans? And um, uh, through, uh, uh, through the auspices of the United Nations, and uh, they came to an agreement in the 1980s about uh, who owns what. And um, the agreement went to the Senate, and it's never been ratified. Mm -hmm. so, but President Reagan said they own it, so they own it. Right? So it's never went through Congress that they own this land. But they claim they own this land more to a higher degree than you've ever owned anything. They own every right of exclusion, every right of exploitation, every right of sale, everything. So how much do they own? They say they own all the land up to 200 nautical miles offshore, which is 230 land miles. Here's another government map of land ownership. This is, this is the uh, a proclamation by uh, Reagan in the 1980s. These are called the exclusive economic zones, and that's the underwater lands owned by the federal government. Again, this is a government map showing this. Uh, the government owns all these circles, they say, in the, uh, in the Pacific because uh, some ship stopped at some uh, atoll in uh, World War II. <laughs> so, and now they say they own, <laughs> they own uh, up to 200 nautical miles around, uh, <laughs> around this uh, landing spot in World War II. Um, uh, this, uh, for instance, this Johnston Atoll here was only uh, 94 acres, and then they built it up to uh, um, a little less than a square mile so they could land planes on it. Uh, and then uh, nobody lives there because they did uh, atomic testing on it, and the people that were there uh, uh, died. Uh, <laughs> eventually, they were, all, they were all radiated. But the feds still say they own it. Right? So, so you own... Uh, 166,000 acres of land surrounding it because you own less than a square mile of, of uh, this little atoll that nobody lives on. It's now claimed by the U.S. government. So they they say that that's the reason they that's the reason for all of these uh, circles here in the Pacific. Other than Hawaii, Hawaii is here too. So. And then uh, Russia has a little thing here. So there's this little carve out because. They didn't want to enter, start a war with Russia over this situation. So, <laughs> all right. So, how much? How much is this? Um, the U.S. government, the federal government, owns more land offshore than there is dry land in the fifty states, by, by a significant amount. Right? So, if if we consider federal lands to be part of the of the country of the United States, most of the U.S. is underwater. That's one way to look at it. The majority is on. I mean, there's more acre. 
there's various, they don't even know how many acres there are, but all the estimates are more than the dry lands, right? Even the conservative estimates of how much acreage this is, or how many square miles of, of land this is, um, um, uh, uh, tells us that they own an awful lot of land here. And again, they say they own it completely. Every right, they, they own it. <laughs> it's like, in the agreement, it's like four pages. We can do this, we can do that, we can do this. We own everything. <laughs> All right, um, so, so, so why am I uh, so upset about this? Uh, well, they don't, let us, they don't let us use the lands. <laughs> we can't use it. This is a restricting uh, seasteading and other... <laughs> we can't... Uh, uh, um, they're, they're just l limiting our uh, ability to get to this stuff here. By the way, uh, part of the agreement is any uh, peaceful ships are allowed to go over the lands, <laughs> as long as they're not military ships. But our government violates this rule all the time. They put military ships on other people's shores all the time, violating the agreement with Reagan. Right? We have military ships within 200 nautical miles of uh, multiple, multiple countries. Um, but anyway, there's, uh, uh, there's several uh, congressional reports about this. Uh, the numbers keep changing, but certainly uh, the, uh, the lands are, are uh, full of uh, resources. Uh, one congressional report says uh, the onshore lands contain $31 billion of oil from conventional sources and 231 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 1.23 trillion barrels of oil from non-conventional sources, which we are now figuring out how to get out of the ground, if they would let us. This is the tight oil sands and the tar sands and things. These are the non-conventional sources. 60% uh, of these Onshore lands are uh, completely closed to oil and gas exploration. 8% are open. There's a standard federal lease for leasing these things. If you want to pay, you have to bid for the, bid for the, you have to buy the rights from the government. They're standing leasing ar arrangements. And then 32% of lands have these restrictive leasing arrangements that limit drilling and production and things. So we just can't get to much of these, uh, to, to much of this oil and gas. The, uh, there, there are estimates of the offshore stuff, but until they let us explore out there, there's just no, certainly the offshore lands, the submerged lands are, have lots of oil and gas and other resources. Right? And there are estimates of it, I don't trust the estimates because until entrepreneurs are able to drill some oil wells out there to figure out what's going on, we're just guessing about how much, how many uh, billions of barrels of oil are offshore that we're not allowed to, um, to access. But in addition to the, um, to the restricting our ability to get to this oil and gas, there's still, there's another issue that's similar to the tax issue, and that's that, uh, this is similar to the, uh, what uh, Dr. Terrell was talking about just an hour ago. Uh, there's a calculation problem here, because there's different royalties, and there's different taxes across these various lands. So, um, we're not always getting out the, the most economical oil because they're, uh, uh, sometimes the most economical oil is the oil they won't even let us look at. Right? Sometimes that's the cheapest oil to get out of the ground. And then there are different royalty rates here. So we end up making decisions that uh, uh, the, the entrepreneurs are, are making calculations, but the, mark, but the prices are not really free market prices because the government owns so much of these resources. So Rothbard says, uh, the allocation of resources in a private enterprise will better satisfy consumer demands while government enterprise will distort allocations and introduce islands of calculational chaos. And that's what we see. That's what we see with the government restriction on drilling in these various lands, and that's what we see with the, with the different tax rates across the various states. Uh, at the end of Power and Market, uh, Rothbard warns us about three things. Uh, in particular, he's, he said we should be worried about the government owning, uh, uh, controlling the money supply, controlling transportation, and controlling land, because they will control the resources. And he thinks this is a great danger. He says, uh, in almost all countries, governments have laid claim to ownership of new unused land. Governments could never own original land on the free market. This act of appropriation by the government already sows the seeds for distortion of market allocation, 
when the land goes into use. If you're able to control these original factors of production, you have great control throughout the rest of the economy. And you introduce these, uh, 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 this calculational chaos throughout the economy. And this is what one of the many things uh, uh, Murray Rothbard is uh, uh, concerned about here. Thank you very much. Thank you.